Uh, welcome everyone to our class on uh, John Milton, uh, the great Puritan poet of the 17th century. Uh, this little intro here is simply that. It is serve as an intro for the course. Uh, as per usual on my uh, classes, the first day of class is simply to uh, go through the syllabus and acquaint you with my uh, course of, of reading for the semester and also to uh, address some issues related to uh, the means of assessment, that is uh, essays and exams and so forth. Uh, but in this particular case, because we're meeting online also to explain something of my uh, current condition and how the course will run at least initially, uh, which is that I'm going to pre-record the classes as I'm doing now and uh, largely uh, use those without too much interaction with the class because on uh, the 19th of December, I was in a, a serious uh, car accident and I've suffered a concussion from that. And so the screen time is something I've been told to uh, avoid. Uh, and the I find the interaction uh, on uh, over video pretty uh, challenging. Uh, this is just looking at a camera, so it's not quite the same thing. Although do a, I do have a screen in front of me, um, which I'm trying not to look at too much. Um, so that that's that. I wanted to say, uh, so this, as I say, uh, uh, it's a course on Milton. And um, let me say a few words about Mr. Milton and, and what he means to me uh, and in terms of my own... Um, vocation as an English uh, professor of English literature and so forth. I encountered Milton myself in first year English. Um, he was not the first work I read, but among the first works I read uh, back at Huron College in the uh, mid 80s. And um, I remember at the time uh, being struck by the majesty of his prose and the sheer substance of uh, his of his intellect. And I have to say at the time, I had uh, some difficulty in following everything I was reading in part because um, I lacked the education that Milton not only himself had, but presumed in his audience. Uh, and we were reading Paradise Lost, which is the great poem in the English language in my opinion. Uh, and that opinion shared by, by many, though not all. Um, I can argue for it, um, but I'm not going to do that here when we come to Milton's Paradise Lost, which we will. Uh, what do I have here? In uh, really the middle of February all the way on to uh, March 22nd. So almost uh, six weeks will go very slowly through Paradise Lost and we will uh, uh, amplify uh, some things I'm saying here. But this is not a course on Paradise Lost. It is on Milton, his poetry, and some of his major prose works. Um, not so much the man Milton, although I will talk about Milton as a figure, because his, uh, his person uh, is as interesting to his forebears as his poetry, it seems. I just taught a course last semester on uh, the romantic epic, uh, which used to be entitled uh, Milton and the Romantics, uh, in large part because of the enormous influence that Milton had on all of those writers. And uh, it was not only they who were influenced by Milton, virtually uh, every writer in the English language has in some way been influenced by Milton, such is his uh, weight and his uh, importance. Um, and one could say the same thing for Shakespeare. And uh, historically, certainly in the uh, presentation of English literature, it is these two figures which were regarded as the greatest uh, literary uh, figures in the English language, that being Shakespeare and Milton. And I note in both cases in our day, in many universities, uh, certainly in the Western world of which I'm most familiar, have uh, not only no longer required Milton as a uh, an author to be read by English students, um, but have actually often dropped him. And that goes now with Shakespeare as well, which was almost unthinkable 
20 years ago, but now is becoming so. So in offering uh, this little course online, uh, which I will put up on my YouTube channel um, as, as per usual, uh, I'm hoping to uh, introduce a figure which um, many such as myself have found enormously rich and beneficial in their own um, studies and in their own uh, lives. Uh, so hopefully that will um, not only bless you, but bless many. Um, but Milton struck me when I was reading him in first year, um, in part because in Paradise Lost, and it's partly the artfulness with which it was told, um, that the account he was telling, I took just like <laughs> the Frankenstein monster in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to be something like a true history. Now, it wasn't that I understood it to be a true history in the account in the sense that it's today presented an eyewitness account because Milton's talking about uh, things that happened before the creation of the world including the uh, battle in heaven between the angels and uh, uh, and the rebel angels uh, that's the account he gives in books five and six of Paradise Lost and obviously uh, he is not only not, not an eyewitness to those, they're barely even alluded to in, in scripture at points. And we'll, we'll get to that when we, when we get to that. Uh, but he also accounts for the creation of the entire cosmos and so forth and the fall of Satan and so forth, which the epic begins with. So it's not historical in the sense of eyewitness, but historical in the sense that he's presenting these things as uh, dogma as facts, as things to be understood and to be believed. And I was very impressed by this as uh, someone in the, who grew up in the public school system um, and went to uh, church as a, a boy, the United Church. But by and large, uh, this was a ritual that I was undertaken at the time. It's what one did. Um, but it was not presented in the sense that there was a uh, a truth that was simply uh, necessary to believe in order to understand the world. And that's what I was encountering in Milton. And that intrigued me. And uh, I recall the professor who taught me at that time um, told us that if we wanted to understand Milton, and for that matter, to flourish in English literature, uh, we needed to read the Bible. We simply needed to. There was no getting around it. There was no other way. And uh, I recall some, some snorts, some notes of derision in the class. And um, the teacher, uh, God bless her, uh, turned on the students and said, uh, you people uh, believe that you are liberal-minded and that you are open-minded for that matter. But you've made, I'll bet most of you have never even opened a Bible. And most of you have made uh, are making judgments about something that you've never read. And we are in a liberal arts college and our, our purpose here is to um, create um, lively intellects and not close-minded people. So you might want to read something before you pronounce judgment upon it. So I was uh, not one of the mockers, but nonetheless, I was uh, duly chastised and I took up the challenge uh, which was presented to us at the time. And uh, for me, it was transformative. So not only Milton, but a prof professor who wanted us to read the text uh, with respect for the author that wrote it and simply try to take it on its own terms without imposing our own view on the text or the author, uh, not bringing our agendas to the text as is so often the case in the academy in our day. So that was a transformative uh, event for me. I decided to switch to my English to English as a major uh, at the end of the year, even though I didn't do particularly well in first year English. And um, I could say the rest is history. Um, there would be a lot more to be said, but I'm not. This is not about me. It's about the course. But that was one of the. Uh, as I say, Milton was an important figure, and not only in his uh, work, but also in his course of reading. So I took a 17th century literature course in, in third year university. And the man who taught that, um, we, we studied many of the works that are on the syllabus now. Uh, it was a whole course on 17th century literature, but half of it roughly was dealing with Milton, uh, such as the uh, enormity of the figure of Milton over the 17th century that he, it really required 
uh, a semester to deal with his work. I mean, I think we could do a whole year uh, very easily, two semesters, and not exhaust uh, everything that deserves uh, scholarly treatment. But we will do a semester, and we will go through his uh, major works. So all of his major poetry, uh, including Paradise Lost, uh, Paradise Regained and Samson Agonistes, those three works which concluded uh, Milton's literary corpus also concluded his, his life. They were all written while he was blind, so he didn't write them with a pen, he dictated them to one of his daughters. Uh, and that's part of the uh, legend of John Milton as a figure. Uh, not only that his uh, poetry is so grand and uh, memorable, uh, and influential, but that he uh, dictated it in much the same way that perhaps, and he, he cites this in his uh, Paradise Lost, in much the same way as perhaps uh, Homer himself, who was reputed to be blind, did. So it's a study in this uh, poet, and I am going to uh, go through something of a, a brief biographical sketch of Milton before dealing with the specific works on the course. I'll just go through the syllabus and talk about what we are going to um, address and make very brief comments about it before concluding that. And then um, uh, we'll meet online. And if there are any questions, then we can follow up with that. So let me just say a few words about Mr. Milton then. Um, he was born in, in London uh, in uh, 1608. And, um, and lived a reasonably uh, lengthy life for the, for the time. He lived to the age of, uh, oh, what would it be, 66. So he died in 1674. Um, best known for his work, Paradise Lost, uh, which is widely regarded as the greatest epic poem in English which to my mind uh, almost makes him the greatest English poet, just ipso facto that it's the greatest epic poem. But there are more reasons for thinking him the great epic poet. He also writes a um, uh, successor to that poem. Sorry, I'm struggling for words here. Uh, Paradise Regained, which is a, a mini epic, and I'll talk about its form and so forth after that. And then finally uh, deals with in Samson Agonistes, a uh, closet drama presented as a tragedy, as it were. And in this, he is covering all of the basic, the core genres of literature uh, as known in the ancient world and that of the Renaissance, for that matter. So uh, in the, for the first work we'll look at on the course is, a, is an ode. The second is a mask, which is a form of drama. Uh, then we'll deal with a few uh, prose treatises. Uh, then we'll look at L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, which are character sketches in the vein of Theophrastus. Uh, we'll also deal with an eclogue in the poem uh, Lycidas. We'll look at the lyric poem in the form of the sonnets before then getting to the major poetry. And my sense, and this was the sense that I was, it was presented to me when I studied him more seriously, was that in his early works, what Milton was doing was trying to master the, uh, all of the forms uh, of, uh, of, of poetry uh, in order to uh, steal himself for the great enterprise of writing an epic poem. He didn't try and write it as many of the romantics did at, uh, at a young age. He, did, he uh, felt he needed to um, work on his technique and so forth, and he did so by writing these shorter forms of poetry. Nonetheless, each of the poems that I've mentioned is in, in themselves uh, a masterpiece of form. And this is what makes him the great poet that I believe that he is. And this is not to compare him to Shakespeare to try and argue my case here. But Shakespeare is uh, more reputed for his, his drama. And of course, he also writes some uh, of sonnets, which makes him more of a Renaissance poem. Whereas Milton is a continuation of the classical tradition, uh, vastly learned, uh, Milton himself, of course, was classically educated. Uh, his uh, paternal grandfather, uh, Richard, um, 
was a Roman Catholic and uh, his father, John, um, was, uh, so there's just a little anecdote here from uh, his father's life. John was reading an English Bible, which of course in those days uh, marked him out as a Protestant. For that, uh, for that reason, his, his, his father, that is Richard, John Milton's grandfather, cast out his son and it disinherited him for that matter. Now, this seems like a, an extraordinary act for reading a book. And what it, what it illustrates to my mind is the seriousness with which religious matters were held in Milton's day. And that includes John Milton himself, of course, and we'll come to see this. And it, it undergirds everything that comes out of his mouth, uh, all of the poetry and the prose treatises for that matter, which I'll address in a minute. But uh, being banished from his father's house, he made a life as a, a scrivener. That is, he prepared uh, documents for legal transactions, and he also lent money and so forth. Um, and um, uh, uh, John uh, Milton Sr. and his wife Sarah uh, had three children. Uh, the eldest was uh, a daughter by the name of Anne. Uh, John was the middle child, and Christopher was the uh, was the youngest. Now, Christopher became a lawyer, and interestingly, uh, was a royalist. And I say the reason that's interesting is because Milton became famous for being on the parliamentarian side, and indeed arguing uh, the justice of of executing uh, Charles the First. And it, it could be uh, some have thought that um, Christopher might even have been a uh, Roman Catholic, although I find that rather doubtful myself. Um, but I have not uh, studied it sufficiently to know one way or the other. I just find that rather uh, difficult to believe. But it is interesting that when uh, in 1660, after uh, the Republic of Oliver Cromwell fell uh, and uh, uh, Charles II, Charles Stuart, uh, came back to England, um, it was John's younger brother, Christopher, among others, um, like uh, Andrew Marvell, who argued on John's behalf that he not be executed for, for treason. Uh, and uh, w because of that, he was given a stay of uh, four years of life in which he wrote those three grand poems that I mentioned uh, at the outset, Paradise Lost, Paradise like Regained, and Samson Agonistes. So where would we be without that intercession? Um, Milton's father was a, a fascinating, um, great, um, not, so he made his living as a scrivener, as I said, and a moneylender, but he was very gifted musically, uh, and that included composition. Uh, because of his wealth, because of his artistic interests, because of his, his own um, advancement and his desire to advance his children's education, he sent his son John to St. Paul's School, probably uh, in, in 1620, and he, would, he also employed tutors on top of that to supplement uh, John's formal education. So one of them is Thomas Young, who's a Scots uh, Presbyterian. Uh, and that's very interesting because Milton himself uh, eventually not only was not a Presbyterian, but would have argued against the Presbyterian uh, view as the one which ought to be held within the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, also, probably in this time, might have heard sermons by, by John Donne at uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, which was not far away from St. Paul's school. And when he was in school, he would have been educated in Latin and Greek, uh, probably acquired proficiency in, in Italian at that stage, um, although I'm not so uh, certain about that, um, but he certainly had the rudiments of that um, and would have also picked up French and uh, started learning Hebrew um, when he uh, left for Cambridge University at the age of 17. Uh, he worked very hard as a scholar at Cambridge, uh, was enormously proficient, um, um, 
known for his 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 great virtue, also known for his uh, strong sense of his own worth. Um, but a man, a godly young man, um, called the Lady of Christ's Christ College, uh, Cambridge, because he had long hair and was particularly good looking, um, and also was um, um, renowned for his virtue. And so he was mockingly called the Lady of Christ College, uh, to which Milton did not um, seem to be bothered. Um, he regarded virtue as all good men uh, as its own reward and did not care for the mockery. Um, but he left uh, Cambridge in 1632 with his bachelor's and a master's degree and then went to a family estate to be with his parents who were aging by this point uh, in a place called Horton. And then he gave himself to a six period year of study. And in that period, uh, he uh, sought to uh, attempt things yet unattempted in prose or rhyme. So he spent uh, those six years reading Greek and Latin authors. And during it's during this time that he wrote the poems, uh, L'Allegro, Il Penseroso, uh, Comus a Mask, Lycidas, and some of the sonnets we'll read uh, leading up to uh, the uh, our, our, our foray into the major epic and so forth. And uh, he regarded them, as I say, as preliminary exercises, as tuning his uh, uh, voice for the grander epics, but they, these poems themselves stand uh, in the uh, great pantheon of English poems. Uh, when he reached around 30, he got uh, tired of his uh, solitude and he left for the continent did what young gentlemen often do, but he was no longer so young. Uh, at the age of around 30, he went to Paris. Yeah, he went to Florence and uh, famously visited Galileo um, under house arrest there at that time, a prisoner of the Inquisition. He also went to Rome. He went to Naples. And he was greeted there as a great poet, uh, spoke in Italian, of course, and um, his, his reputation as a poet uh, had already preceded him at that point. And he made a great deal of, of friends, including among Roman Catholics, uh, which would aid him in uh, later years. Because while he was abroad, news of uh, civil war was brewing in England and he decided to curtail his travels and to return back in England because he thought it uh, disgraceful while his, and I quote, while my cit fellow citizens fought for liberty at home to be traveling for pleasure abroad. And so he returned home and uh, started writing uh, pamphlets, uh, pamphlets supporting the parliamentarian's cause against uh, the king. Um, and he attacked corruptions of the state, also attacked corruptions of the church, and held to the ideals of the Puritan party, which was as I say, the parliamentarians, uh, got married uh, to a young woman by the name of Mary Powell. Uh, some, I wouldn't say scandal, but some eyebrows raised at that, at that because he was 33 and she was 17. She was also the daughter of royalists. Um, the marriage was not a very happy one. Um, Milton was a, a, a scholarly type, used to a solitary existence. Mary came from a large family. Um, she left him after a month uh, and, and remained um, uh, separated from him for three years. Uh, and eventually they reconciled. Uh, but during this time, Milton was so upset by this uh, uh, occurrence that he wrote something called the Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce. And he argued for incompatibility as a grounds for divorce. And this was um, uh, a great furore arose over this a storm of protest and the government sought to prosecute him because he had published this without a license. And interestingly, in response to this, and I'll get to this when we come to Areopagitica, at this point, it was the parliamentarians that were in, in office. Uh, he, he wrote, uh, Areopagitica as a defense of free speech um, uh, and um, 
after after Parliament had just uh, written a uh, document that said one had to, one had to obtain, uh, as I say, uh, uh, an imprimatur that is a license in order to publish anything. Well, he published this area pagetica in, in the face of that, and so it was flying directly in the face of Parliament at the time. Uh, and it's considered to be widely considered to be the great uh, defense of freedom of the press in the English language. I myself certainly hold to that. And we'll get to that soon. Um, but uh, in uh, 1649, and this was 1649 is an important day because this is the date in which Charles I was executed. He published a, a document called the Tenure of Kings and Magistrates and argued, and I, I believe it's uh, for the first time, that uh, the people had the right to execute a guilty sovereign. Um, it's not that tyrannicide is, was never argued for. It was argued, of course, in, in the ancient world, but it was also argued for um, amongst, um, amongst Christians. So you can find uh, in... Um, even in Augustine's work, a justification for tyrannicide. Um, and likewise, back in uh, John of Salisbury's Polycraticus, he argues the idea that uh, the, the, the body politic is a political organism in which all members uh, cooperate in the common utility and the common good. Uh, and as a result, uh, if a ruler fails in his duties or, or even is detrimental to the commonwealth, then they are duty bound uh, to God to correct that and ultimately to slay the tyrant. But he doesn't argue it's the people. He would argue that it would be the uh, magistrates that would lead that. We'd find something similar in a document written by the French Huguenots uh, in 1579, Vindicie contra tyrannos. Um, and the argument there are, is related to um, whether people are uh, justified biblically uh, in opposing the king against his alleged divine rights. And the argument in Vindicie contra Tyrannos, just like in, uh, in uh, as I say, in Aquinas and also in uh, John of Salisbury, is not only are they entitled to it, they are duty bound to do so. Uh, if all other legal uh, means have been exhausted. And um, in Vindicia contra Tyrannos, they do so. One of the four questions uh, er, uh, to be asked is whether people can resist a king on the grounds that he's destroying the commonwealth. And the, the answer in the affirmative, yes, they may on that grounds. But Milton is unique because he is saying it is the people that might do this the people who might raise their hands up to uh, take the life of a tyrant. And so in that sense, he seems to be leaning towards um, more contemporary justifications out of the, the French Revolution and so forth. Um, but he publishes this work, The Tenure of Kings and Magistrates, uh, and the following month, he is appointed the Secretary for Foreign Tongues for the Republic, um, Cromwell's government. And for the ensuing years, uh, he writes to foreign governments, writing pamphlets defending uh, Cromwell's government and keeping the European powers from descending and seeking to uh, get rid of a uh, tyrannicide government or a regicide government as they would have presented it. Um, Eventually, Cromwell's government uh, falls. It falls with, with, the de with the death of Cromwell. And Milton is uh, forced into hiding, arrested. The copies of all his pamphlets are burnt. Uh, and as I say, he narrowly escapes prosecution um, because of powerful friends uh, at court, uh, which he had made. Now, he made them, and it says something about his character then as well. Uh, he may have written polemical pamphlets, but he clearly was a man who was admired by uh, many. Uh, and uh, despite his actions on behalf of the, of the uh, 
uh, Cromwell's government, he managed to survive uh, the return of the executed king's son. And then he wrote his great works. Pamp, as I say, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, Samson, Agonistes, all of which he was blind while writing. Now, he uh, had uh, three wives in the end, but I think that's uh, irrelevant at this point. But he, he uh, I mentioned uh, one of his wives, um, she died, and then he had a second, and then finally a third. They all died. There was no divorce, despite his uh, pamphlet arguing uh, the legitimacy of that. Uh, in general, Milton is uh, a, a unique figure in his religious views. Um, he's certainly Puritan. He is uh, Calvinistic, I would say, because he's a Puritan. All, all Puritans are Calvinist of some variety, but he's certainly, uh, in his own views, rather unique in this. Um, Puritan and independent. Uh, the man who taught me uh, Milton years ago, E.J. Devereux, said that he belonged to the church of John Milton, um, rather tongue-in-cheek, but I think there's, uh, it's true insofar as that he had his own strong views on these things. It's certainly the case that he argued for the disestablishment of the Church of England. He thought that the crown and uh, the church ought to be separated um, and to get rid of this religious hierarchy, which he saw as detrimental to the gospel. Uh, and he wrote many anti uh, works of anti prelatical, anti -prelatical uh, tracts, um, arguing for the need for an individual to be exposed to scripture without interference from the government, without interference from church government even. Um, and he argued against a fixed liturgy, uh, which he also thought was an impediment to individual uh, growth. And these are all very radical doctrines, not just uh, for his... Uh, age, but even for today, the idea that uh, an individual exposed to the word of God will grow naturally, organically, as it were. Uh, and to some degree, it, it exists in a tension with his uh, firm conviction that one ought to be educated in the classics. Uh, and we'll get to that uh, apparent uh, contradiction and certainly a sense of conflict and paradox when we come to his work of education. And we'll do that in uh, the uh, towards the end of January. But I said I would go through the syllabus very briefly. I mean, I think I more or less have already, but let me just go through it again. So next class, we will be looking at his ode on the morning of Christ's nativity. Um, the ode being an ancient literary form. Uh, I'll say more about it uh, for our class on Wednesday. Uh, but it is... Uh, written when I believe he was at Cambridge. Uh, I believe he was 19 when he wrote it. I'll have to check my notes. It's going off the top of my head. Uh, but it is a masterpiece, as it were. Uh, and it speaks about uh, the importance of, of music and so forth, a reflection not only of his father's uh, musical gifts, but also of Milton's own uh, musical aptitude and his connection of the uh, capacity for writing, composing music with the music of the cosmos. And I'll talk more about that in, in our class. Uh, we'll also look at a very brief little uh, tribute that he writes uh, to Shakespeare. So it's on Shakespeare, uh, which would have appeared, I believe, in the second edition of Shakespeare's um, uh, folio. There's a little um, preface to that on Shakespeare, uh, which, which testify to <clears throat> the fact that even early on Milton was regarded as a sufficiently great poet that he should write the preface, uh, preface to Shakespeare. Um, then we'll look at this, uh, his work Comus, A Mask. It's a form of, of, uh, of theater uh, which began uh, in Catholic circles, very much associated with Catholicism. Uh, Milton writes and makes distinct contributions to the genre which, um, which deviate from its Catholic uh, tendencies and push it towards a more Protestant uh, presentation. And in that, I'm going to argue against uh, the portrait, uh, very common amongst feminist scholars, that Milton is some sort of misogynist figure. Um, 
I think uh, there are there's ample reason to think to see Milton in far more charitable terms than uh, that of being a misogynist, uh, a judgment which is based on a few small passages in his works, and also f perhaps for his treatment of his of his daughters. Um, but we'll come to that when we come to it. Uh, then we will look at two of his uh, prose treatises. I'd like to look at more, but we simply lack time to do that uh, adequately. So we'll begin with Area Pagitica, this great defense of free speech, uh, before moving uh, on to his treatise of education, which I think you might find interesting uh, insofar as it so broadly differs from modern education theory, not only in the curriculum it presents, but in the way in which it is to be presented. Uh, Milton weighing in on the great one of the great uh, subjects of interest of his day, namely, how ought we to educate? And there is a great deal of innovation in education in this period. Uh, and then we'll move on to the two great poems, uh, two different character types, L'Allegro, the cheer cheerful man, uh, and Il Penseroso, the uh, contemplative or the uh, melancholic figure. Um, so that'll be on the 27th. Then we'll spend two uh, classes looking at his poem, Lycidas, a pastoral eclogue. Um, and uh, I'll talk about the, the greatness of this, this poem as well before uh, concluding uh, or leading up to the conclusion of the first part of the course with a uh, look at a few of his sonnets. Um, <clears throat> then we will uh, move to uh, Paradise Lost. And as I say, we will look at that in um, some detail. Uh, we'll spend a few weeks on it, uh, going through the books rather ponderously, uh, giving you some background, trying to enrich your experience of that. Uh, we'll, go, we'll do that beginning on February 10th, and we will conclude on March 22nd with Paradise Lost. And then we will conclude with three classes on Paradise Regained and uh, two on Samson Agonistes. And that will conclude the course. Uh, the um, essays, and uh, there are two essays um, there, and I don't even think I've listed the length of the essays on this. This is not good. Um, but I will say right now, and we'll put it in that, that the, the first essay is 2,000 words, and the second is 2,500. Uh, and then we'll have a final uh, exam during the exam period, uh, the time of which I will announce at the time. Other than that, I think I have said more or less what I wanted to say. I've appended a select bibliography, which I have put on the Moodle site, and I think I've got eight pages of material there. Um, there's, a, there's just so much written on Milton. Um, that's actually a select bibliography and giving you eight pages. Um, some sources here that you might find more helpful than others. Uh, I think this is quite useful. So the Oxford Handbook uh, of Milton uh, contains several interesting and helpful essays. Oh, yay. Um, as for the book that we will, uh, I've recommended, and I've done so largely because of the cost, but also the excellence of the work. This is the work that I recommend. So this is the complete poetry of John Milton by Shawcross. Um, this is my old edition from years ago. I have all sorts of things stuffed in it and things underlined, so I find it helpful to use it. But it's relatively inexpensive. I find the notes helpful, but not overbearing. Uh, they help you to read the text, but they do not... Um, weigh you down with scholarly opinions um, that are going to distract you from the main purposes, which is simply to acquaint yourself with the great work of Mr. Milton himself. Uh, the supplemental material, critical insights and so forth, I'll try to provide in my commentary. Uh, and um, my main purpose here is simply, as I say, to get you to appreciate a great literary figure. With that, I am done for now. I will... Uh, sign off and I will see you next time. Uh, once again, we will be looking at uh, the Nativity Ode, Ode on the Morning of Christ's Nativity. Next time I'll see you then.